<coughs> as a starting point, you may wish to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah and chapter 40. <coughs> now, if you were here last Sunday evening, uh, then you may remember that uh, we listed the attributes of God, the characteristics of God, under two headings, uh, those being the communicable and incommunicable attributes. And if we can have them on the screen, just to remind you, the incommunicable attributes are those that God does not share or communicate to others. And as you can see from the list, it includes such characteristics as God being infinite, self-existent, omnipresent, and so on. Those attributes belong to God and to God alone. The communicable attributes, on the other hand, in the second part, are those that God does share or communicate to us in the sense that we as creatures, and especially as redeemed creatures, are supposed to reflect those aspects of God's character to some extent. And included among the communicable attributes of God are His holiness, His wisdom, the fact that he's good, loving, faithful, and so on. Now, it's not my intention over the coming weeks uh, to go through all the attributes of God one by one. Instead, what I intend to do is pick a selection from both categories. And uh, this evening, we are going to think about three of the incommunicable attributes. The first being that God is infinite. God is infinite. One thing that we do throughout our lives and that is done to us throughout our lives is that we measure and we are measured. No sooner are we born and someone writes on our birth certificate eight pounds, four ounces. As we enter the world, we are measured. We go to school and our intelligence is continually being measured until finally we sit our A-levels when our intelligence is ultimately measured by the number of A's, B's and C's we get, that assuming we didn't get any A-stars. If you did, then apologies. We start work and our performance is continually being measured by targets, promotions, pay rises, and so on. That is some of the ways in which we are measured. And at the same time, we are continually measuring both ourselves and the other people around us. We weigh ourselves. We time ourselves to see how long it takes us to do the crossword or to get up Snowden. We check our bank account to measure our wealth. We read the fine print on our shopping items to measure how many calories we are consuming. We are continually looking to the clock to measure how much time we have left. We regularly check our social media accounts to measure how popular we are. We celebrate birthdays as a means of measuring our age. And in addition to measuring ourselves against those objective standards, we also measure ourselves against the more subjective standard of the people around us. For example, I may only have got three Bs in my A-levels, but I was second best in the class. It may take me three hours to get up Snowden, but that's a lot faster than most people my age. I may not be a millionaire, but I'm still in the world's top 5% when it comes to personal wealth. I may not be perfect, but at least I don't have a criminal record like lots of people I know. We are continually measuring ourselves against other people, and in doing so, we take great comfort. Great comfort, probably because we are careful who we measure ourselves against. It's usually those people that make us look good. Life in this world is characterized from start to finish by measurements of one kind or another. We measure and we are being measured continually. 
And did you know that is one of the ways, as someone said, that is one of the ways in which God is so very different from us. Well, the Bible makes it clear that God does measure. And he does so in ways and on a scale that we can't, that blows our minds. For example, in the chapter we've just read, chapter 40, we read these words, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Or who with the breadth of his hands has marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Although such means of measurements and such size of measurements are beyond us, someone has measured the oceans and the mountains and the islands effortlessly like that. And that is the eternal God. That is why we read a few verses later, he weighs the islands. Oh yes, the islands. You know, we're on an island tonight, the British Isles. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. And the fascinating thing is that he not only measures those things that are too vast for us to measure, he also measures those things that are too small and too detailed for us to measure. For example, do you remember what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10? Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Numbered by an eternal and infinite God. And yet, although he is the God who measures everything, he is at the same time the God who cannot be measured. Cannot be measured. After describing the way in which God measures the oceans and the mountains and so on, Isaiah says this, chapter 40, verse 13, quoting the ESV, who has measured the Spirit of the Lord? And the answer, of course, is no one. God cannot be measured for the simple reason that he is infinite. Whereas we are finite creatures, he is the infinite creator. And what that means in practice is that although we and every aspect of creation are confined by limits of one kind or another, we're confined by physical limits, mental limits, scientific limits, material limits. Although we are confined by limits of one kind or another, there are no limits with God. He's not limited by anything. Although we and every aspect of creation are confined by boundaries, there are no boundaries with God. Although we are measurable in every respect, if not by ourselves, then certainly by our Creator, although we are measurable in every respect and quantifiable, He simply cannot be measured or quantified. And no matter which particular attribute we may be considering, whether it be communicable or incommunicable, it is defined and it is qualified by this one. For example, God is omniscient because he is infinite in his knowledge. He is omnipotent because he is infinite in his power. His righteousness is an infinite righteousness. His love is an infinite love. His holiness is an infinite holiness. And because he is characterized in every respect by such infiniteness, if that's the right word, any attempt to understand the character and being of God must, by necessity, it always must be nothing more than a scratch at the surface. As we discovered from 1 Corinthians 2 this morning, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. That is what the Spirit does. <laughs> but as for man, listen to the words of Zophar in Job chapter 11. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? 
They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They're deeper than the depths of the grave. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. As David says in Psalm 145, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Or as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 11, having taken 11 whole chapters to explain God's great work of redemption, he says this, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For through him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Some of us may be tempted to think that if we could understand the book of Romans better, or even fully, then we would have perfectly figured out God and his work of redemption. And yet even the man who wrote it, and who surely knew what he was talking about when he wrote it, even he humbly and reverently at the end of chapter 11 acknowledges that there is a depth to the wisdom and knowledge and judgments of God that are simply way beyond our ability to fathom. And the fact that our God is infinite in all his attributes ought to be a great comfort to us, even if there are times when we find it a little bit frustrating. Yes, if we're to be honest, there are times when we find it frustrating, especially at those times when God is working in our world and especially in our lives in ways that we do not understand and cannot fathom. That is why we hear the psalmist crying out on occasions, Why, Lord? His ways are not our ways. And yet, in addition to that frustration on occasion, it ought to be a great comfort to know that we have a God who is not limited or restricted or bound by those factors and those parameters that so quickly limits us as finite beings, we quickly reach our limits, quickly. We run out of our resources as, infinite be as finite beings. And although other people can be a great help on occasions, we must always remember that the people around us are finite beings as well. And therefore they too will reach their limit and they may very well reach their limit with us quicker than we had expected. And yet what a comfort to know as we sang a little while ago when we have exhausted our store of endurance when our faith strength has failed ere the day is half done when we reach the end of our hoarded resources our Father's full giving is only begun and that is because his love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And that is the comfort of having a God who is infinite. Secondly, God is not only infinite, God is eternal. God is eternal. Now, although I haven't personally seen it, I am uh, reliably informed that inscribed on a, a clock case in Chester Cathedral uh, is a poem which reads as follows. Has anybody seen it in Chester Cathedral? No? Well, there is a poem inscribed on a clock case that reads as follows. When as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I waxed more bold, time strolled. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall find in passing on, time gone. And I'm sure most of us, and especially those of us who are a little bit older tonight, I'm sure we can testify to the truthfulness 
of that little poem. Do you remember as a child, the time gap between one birthday and the next birthday seemed to be so long, so long that we wanted to try and speed it up. Whereas now that we are older, we are doing all that we can to slow it down. <laughs> and yet our efforts, both as children and as older people, is a sheer waste of time because we can't, we can neither slow it down nor speed it up. That is because time is not something that we have invented. Time is not something that we can change. Instead, there is a given, given by our Creator and embedded into the very warp and woof of how his creation operates. It's not Rolex who invented time. It's God. And we are reminded of that as soon as we open our Bibles. On the very first page we read, And there was evening and morning the first day. And there was evening and morning the second day, and so on. The very existence of time and days and weeks and months and years owes its existence to our Creator. And the way in which he has created our world. And as creatures within that creation, we are bound by the limitations of time. That is why we grow old. There is a myth of science fiction that says that we can step outside of time or that we can stop it. A myth. Well, last night we did manage to stop it for an hour <laughs> as we put our clocks back. And those of you who come from countries where that doesn't happen, you're perhaps thinking to yourself here, that was a great idea. <laughs> I got an extra hour in bed. Why don't we do that every night? Or at least every Saturday night? Well, if you're still here at the end of March, you'll find out why we don't do it all the time. And that is because you have to make up the time sooner or later by losing an hour's sleep. As created beings living in a created world, we simply cannot escape the limitations of time and the passing of time. It is rolling on, whether you like it or not. And yet there is someone who can and does escape the limitations of time and the passing of time. And that is the God who created time in the first place. One of the things which sets him apart from us is that he is outside of time. I know it's difficult to get our minds around, but we need to try and think about that. He is outside of time. And that is why the very first words of the Bible read, in the beginning, God created. At the beginning, in the very beginning, at the beginning of time, God already was. He was there before time was. He existed before time began, and he will continue to exist when time as we know it has come to an end. As we heard Moses say in Psalm 90, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And because God is outside of time, that means that he's not affected by time in the same way that you and I are. He doesn't get older with the passing of time. He doesn't get frailer with the passing of time, and he doesn't die with the passing of time. He is not only without beginning, he is also without end. But not only is his existence not affected by time, neither is his knowledge affected by time. Unlike you and me, he doesn't need to wait until the months and years pass to figure out what is happening or what is going to happen. He knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. To God, all of time, what you and I describe as past, present and future, to God, all of time is equally known and equally clear and equally certain. He forgets nothing. And nothing takes him by surprise. As we read in the psalm, and as Peter reminds us in his second letter, 
And here, this gives you just a little glimpse, one of the few glimpses that we have in Scripture of God's relationship to time. And it's a fascinating verse in Peter, 1 Peter 3, eh, 2 Peter 3, with the Lord. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now, that does not mean that we should set up a conversion program on our computers, which divides everything by a thousand so that we start working according to God's time scale. That's not what it means. What it more likely means is that events over a long period of time, a massive period of time, a thousand years, events over a long period of time appear to God as if they were happening in a day, yesterday or today. That's how vivid and clear they are to God. We cannot remember things a year ago, 10 years ago, and the longer you get for the back, our memory is getting fader and worse and worse and worse. A thousand years with God, it's as if it was today or yesterday. It's as fresh as that. Well, the events of a day, because it works both ways, remember, the events of a day seem to last a thousand years to God in that they continue to be vivid and clear ever before him and ever present to him. But although God is outside of time and therefore unaffected by time in the way that we are, that does not mean that time as we know it is of no relevance to him or of no interest to him. That's not what it means. Although he is outside of time and unaffected by time, he still sees events in time and he chooses to act in time. For example, we read in Galatians chapter 4, but when the time had fully come. Now there's a thought. For an eternal God who is outside of time. When the time had fully come, God sent his son. Born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law. Paul tells us in Acts 17. Now some people today, this morning, picked me up. And many people over the years have picked me up on the fact that I speak about a past eternity. And they think, you know, what does that really mean? Well, I know that uh, philosophically it's not uh, very accurate. I should find another way of expressing it. But uh, here's one. God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And so although God is outside of time, it doesn't mean that time is just one big muddle as far as God is concerned. No, God determined when time started and God will determine when it comes to an end. And in between that beginning and that end, God is working out his eternal plans and purposes within the time-ordered structure of our world. And from what we are told in both Galatians 4 and Acts 17, it would appear that and if you struggle with me saying a past eternity, you might struggle with me saying about God's calendar. It appears that the big red letter days in God's calendar, if I can use such human terms, are those days surrounding the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth. Those are the big events in God's calendar. Because it was at the first coming of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago that the eternal God stepped into time in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And he did so in order to rescue sinners like you and me from the deserved consequences of the sins that we have committed in time. And the other big day is when that same Jesus returns to judge this world and to take his rescued and redeemed people home to be with him forever. Those seem to be the big red letter days in God's calendar. And therefore, if you're not a Christian this evening, and those are the big days in the past history of our world and the future history of our world that you need to seriously think about. And if you are a Christian, then those are the big days that you need to be continually looking back on and continually looking forward to, looking back 2,000 years to the coming of Christ, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and looking forward to that day when he will come again. And you can do so because the eternal God who is outside of time 
has in his grace chosen to work in time. Thirdly and finally, God is immutable or unchanging. Now, as I've mentioned already, one of the consequences of being a finite creature, and this came out in our discussion, is that we change. We change physically with the passing of time. We change mentally with the passing of time. As we discovered last week, if we are Christians, then we ought to be changing morally and spiritually with the passing of time. Uh, do you remember that verse at the close of 2 Corinthians 3? And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory and as you no doubt know from experience we not only change physically mentally morally but we can also change emotionally with a very little passing of time one day we can feel as if we are on the mountain top the next day we can feel as if we're in the darkest valley and even within a day, our feelings and our emotions can be up and down like a yo-yo. All it takes is for there to be a slight change in our circumstances or for someone to say the wrong word and our emotions can change rapidly. But although we are always changing and in some ways ought to be changing, God is not like that. He does not and cannot change. Speaking through the Old Testament prophet Malachi, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Likewise, James says in the opening chapter of his letter, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lies, who does not change like shifting shadows. You know how quickly shadows can change, how quickly they move. We are like that in many respects. But God does not change like shifting shadows. And in the closing chapter of Hebrews, we read that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The eternal God is unchanging. And as Mr. Berkhoff reminds us in his systematic theology, he is unchanging in four respects. He's unchanging in his being, in his attributes, in his purposes, and in his promises. And therefore, however little or much you can depend on the word of those around you, there is one whose word you can wholeheartedly depend upon, and that is your God. We make promises in our lives, throughout our lives, and sadly there are some we don't keep. Either because we had no intention of keeping them when we first made them, or perhaps we've forgotten about them, or perhaps due to changes in us or our circumstances, we've discovered that we just cannot keep them. But what is true of changeable us is not true of your unchanging God. As God once said through the prophet Balaam, God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Or as Samuel the prophet said in 1 Samuel 15, he who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. And therefore it is not only with respect to his promises that God is unchanging, he is also unchanging with respect to his purposes. As the psalmist says in Psalm 33, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. His plans and purposes don't change. And that is why the believer can take great comfort in such truths as election and predestination. Having planned and purposed I was going to say a past eternity. <laughs> but having planned and purposed an eternity to save a people for himself, we can have every confidence that God will not change his mind with respect to those plans and purposes and that they will come to pass. Having determined to build his church, 
we can be sure that the risen, exalted Christ will do just that. Matthew 16. But let us never forget that the reason why God is unchanging in his promises and purposes is because he is unchanging in his being and attributes. If God could change in any of his attributes, then we could never be quite sure what kind of God we have come to know and trust. It doesn't bear thinking about. How often have we heard someone say in relation to someone else, oh, he's not the person I once knew. Or worse still, he's not the man I married those many years ago. But what is sometimes true of us and our changeableness is never true of our unchanging God. As Mr. Babink says, and I'll read, Nevertheless, the doctrine of God's immutability is of the highest significance for religion. The contrast between being and becoming marks the difference between the creator and the creature. Every creature is continually becoming. It is changeable, constantly striving, seeks rest and satisfaction, and finds this rest in God, in him alone, for only he is pure being and not becoming. Hence, in Scripture, God is often called the rock. And then there's numerous references. On him man can firmly rely. He does not change with respect to his being, nor with respect to his knowing or willingness or willing. He ever remains himself. Every change is foreign to God. He transcends every change in time, for he is eternal. In space, for he is omnipresent. In essence, for he is pure being. Do you see the difference between God being and us becoming? We are in a process of change. God is unchanging. And of those many references to God being a rock in Scripture, over 20 of them apparently occur in the Psalms. For example, in Psalm 18, the Psalm that we sang a few minutes ago, verse 3, we hear David saying, For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Psalm 31, turn your ear to me, come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. In a world of rapidly changing circumstances as David was in, and being surrounded by increasingly changeable people as David discovered, David discovered that there was an unchanging rock that he could look to for his safety and his sustenance, for his security and salvation. And that rock was the infinite, the eternal, and the unchanging God. And many years later, many things have changed, <laughs> but our world in some ways hasn't changed. It's still rapidly changing. Our circumstances are continually changing. The people around us may very well be very changeable. But in the midst of all the change, David's God is still our God. He hasn't changed. And he never will. He is still the infinite, the eternal, the unchanging God. And therefore, as David discovered, you and I can still look to him and trust in him to be a rock when everything else around us is subject to change.